Uh, we will wait just two minutes to start the, the streaming. Um, okay, we will continue the morning session with the roundtable exploring best practices in bilateral cooperation. How do we make our collaboration more effective? <laughs> so I will chair and we have the panelists, uh, Luca Pesati, Emilio Cano, Tibor Kuhn, Luis Barba, and Tom Lerner. So I would like to give the, the word to, to Luca, please. Thank you, thank you, José Luis. So what to say? You still have to see some science today, which you will see later, but let's fix some points. Uh, about the cooperation in this field, you saw in the presentation of Aurelie that the European Commission is still thinking how to structure the European to Latin America cooperation, but they went as far as to create a group on research infrastructures. There's a bit of history here because we asked you to apply for a science visit and we prepared the document and we submitted the document for science visit to happen. Then it ended up in a strange way in the meeting of this group in Vienna in September. They had to decide the topics, the formal topics for this cooperation, and they ended up not deciding anything. Actually, we had also a, a bit of a problem of communication with the group of delegates, because what I personally understood is that one country, one vote, so I understood that also Europe would have voted in that, me in that meeting, but it ended up that uh, only the Latin American delegates voted in Vienna, and uh, uh, the Latin American countries involved in this table are 30, so a bit, it's a big number, <laughs> and we were not prepared to handle, let's say, propaganda for heritage science in 30 separate countries. So, formally speaking, in Vienna, uh, heritage science was not in the headlines after the vote, but I have been contacted by the Italian representative in this, in this cooperation project, which is going on. So I, I have news concerning what is going to happen, even if the situation is still very, very uncertain. First, who is going to cooperate this um, collaboration activity, which is a CSA, uh, co Collaboration and Support Activity of the European Commission? It's an European project which will be submitted in February, I think, in March, okay, one month more. In March 2019, it will be coordinated by Immaculada Figueroa. Uh, is she still at the Mimeco or she's with the new minister? Uh, <coughs> it's a new. Oops. Sorry. Well, the name of the ministry has changed. Is then now we luckily now we have a ministry of science, uh, education, and uh, ministry of science, uh, research, and uh, universities. So, so the group of infrastructures yeah. moved to the new yeah. ministry. So That's uh, actually, the same yeah. people, yeah. Uh, but, but now we are uh, we have uh, those people under uh, a ministry specifically dedicated to science. We are not anymore depending on economy, as we were uh, previously. Well, thanks. So, Immaculada Figueroa will be the coordinator mm -hmm. of this initiative in research infrastructure. Generally speaking, research infrastructure from Madrid. I met Immaculada twice, once in Vienna after the meeting and more recently in Brussels. And we had a dialogue. By the way, in Vienna there were also the Mexican uh, delegate to this table. I met her. I don't know if she's going to the meeting or what. Okay. We, we spoke. The point is that uh, everybody seems to be interested in having heritage science as part of the pilots of this project, but we don't know how to manage. Uh, the CNR is the official partner for Italy that has been confirmed. So as I told, uh, Iris is coordinated by the CNR. This could make things easier. But Marilena Rossano, who is the delegate to the LAC uh, cooperation table for Italy, recently told me, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, before I left for Brazil, called me and told me that they are insisting, Italy is insisting uh, in uh, promoting nanotechnologies and heritage science as pilot actions. So Italy is still formally and officially insisting in 
this as a pilot for the cooperative project. So I don't know how it will land. I don't think we need to have a formal placement by the European Commission in, the, in this cooperation activity, but it would be very nice if we end up being a, a, a formal team of cooperation. We have ways of cooperating even without that situation to be developed. The more practical and pragmatic way that I'm proposing here, we have to submit the next Hyperion, Hyperion HS. And in that integrating activity under the voice networking, <coughs> we can put some resources for three years more of international cooperation. And so we will have the capacity of at least participating to workshops like this one. And I also asked Tom yesterday if it will be possible to have a, a workshop of heritage science for all the Americas organized by in Los Angeles by the Getty. So uh, this is my proposal that I asked him yesterday. So it's very, very fresh. Uh, in that case, uh, if the Hyperion... Uh, Luca, and I said yes. <laughs> and he said <laughs> yes, say. of course. So thank you. The, the point is that we need to submit Hyperion in March and uh, we need the, the project being approved. So in that case, we can secure the participation of all the researchers in the network on the European side. Then, from resources on the Mexican side, Brazilian side, uh, American side for participating to this cooperation, we would like to have workshops also in Europe, not just here. And we would like that you are capable to come to those workshops, participate in the activities, uh, research and networking activities of the project. So actually, the problem of cooperating is resources everywhere. So we need strategies to find resources. In Brazil, we discussed a proposal moved by Antonio Candeias of the University of Evora about an Erasmus Plus initiative to secure some mobility at the level of researchers between Europe and, and maybe you could follow this because probably UNAM uh, should, should be part of this, of this new initiative which uh, Antonio proposed uh, last week, so we need to keep yeah. up to date with what could be the next steps. Yes, for the moment I, I say too much, so <laughs> I will answer <laughs> questions later. Or <laughs> thank you. Just to follow, I will comment that we have uh, several meetings with the Conacyt people that is related with this, what's related to this Vienna meeting. But one problem that you know is that we have today the new authorities of Conacyt, so um, we need to wait to to see what happened with the, with the proposals and, and so on. Yes, we, ne we need some time to, to know more about the future collaborations and how we can manage that. Okay. So I will uh, ask the Emilio to continue, please. Okay. Well, uh, Luca has talked about the resources. As you said, it is, is a critical point in, in, in doing any kind of activities. Um, of course, this is fundamental, but uh, having a lot of resources or little resources, we need, uh, for me, a, a key for collaboration is to know each other. This is something we, uh, we are starting to do formally. Of course, we know uh, something about uh, our activities uh, from our uh, experiences uh, or previous activities in our group, but formally having these meetings, uh, joining uh, the infrastructures in Mexico and in Europe, and having the opportunity to be here, seated together and explaining in detail uh, what we are doing in, 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 our, uh, in both sides of, of the Atlantic. Uh, for me, it's uh, a, a critical point, and this is something that uh, needs to be uh, further developed. We have seen, we have learned, for instance, that uh, there are several uh, parallel uh, developments, uh, your uh, LANSIC uh, um, infrastructure or laboratory has many similarities with uh, IP or NIRIS activities. Uh, you have represented the network, your national network. This is something that there's n so far, at least as far as I know, there's no European uh, network, but there are several national networks in different in different countries. For instance, 
we have had the chance now to to talk uh, with uh, Luis Barba about the, the parallelism between the uh, Mexican network and the Spanish network that we have is very similar. And, and just in in a few minutes, in a in a coffee break, we have been able to find some possible points of contact. So for me, the one of the most critical points is is to carry on with these kind of activities to know each other uh, better better uh, to identify what are the common interests and also it is from a practical point of view it is also very important to know uh, not only from the let's say scientific point of view the situation of each side but also from a practical point of view to learn about the instruments uh, the kind of support we have the bureaucratic limitations that we have in, in, in each side. We, more or less in Europe, we know how it works, and, uh, but we don't really know how things work uh, regarding funding or organization of, of this kind of projects or infrastructures in other places. So it, it is also very important to, to, to have the opportunity to share these different approaches and to and because I'm sure there are many points of the many similarities, the many points that are similar, but of course there will be some different uh, points, uh, some, dif some different uh, approaches in, in, in both sides. So it is very important again to know each other also in this in this kind of, of uh, in these aspects to uh, to do this. Of course, having this having this knowledge, and uh, we will need to look for resources to continue with the collaboration. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, the w we will be able to find uh, this. Uh, we will have this next Horizon Europe uh, framework program, and uh, we are now in, in, in the very first steps of the negotiation of this framework program, and uh, I'm sure if we have a strong connection, a strong network in this field of uh, infrastructure for heritage science, we can try to put this in the agenda of the negotiation of the next uh, uh, framework program. Uh, that could be a good opportunity. And uh, so it is my, my point. Okay. We will continue with uh, Professor Tibor Kuhn. Do you want to comment yeah. something? Before Tibor starts, I would like to comment on this point. We yes, are please. speaking of situations which are unique. So it could be easy to to tell this story, because IRIS is the only European infrastructure in the field. We have no competitors, and as we see the situation here, you have no competitors. So it's structures that representing the whole scientific community and system. So this story can be told, and relationship, uh, either we have a relationship through these structures, or we have no relationship. So this is the easy message to pass. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind presentation, Mr. Rubakawa. I was uh, totally uh, convinced that uh, we are here uh, speaking and having the opportunity to learn a lot about how amazingly and incredibly huge the Mexican background for every kind of studying and, and uh, research <coughs> and infrastructures and doing their own practice everywhere in the map of this two million square kilometers of country. So first of all, this is an opportunity to study, to understand what is happening, and for the other hand, knowing that already in Europe, in the European platform, there are already existing formulas, there are already existing joint research infrastructures and activities and it's a proper moment I think 
to help each other to know better the backgrounds, <coughs> to develop those ideas that probably may be used in Mexico, but are already functioning in the European uh, platforms, because we think that, by the way, Institute of Physics is the flagship, it's the leader in all of these uh, <coughs> background conditions, what you were mentioning, in not only in uh, archaeological, but in cultural heritage sciences. But uh, you may know in which directions, through what kind of mechanisms or canalizations, you would be able to gather efforts and to be able to get on the interface how to communicate, how to try your best practice towards these European uh, institutions. And just one other feeling what I can uh, express that uh, it's a very good and healthy situation how it was presented the nowadays quality and equilibrium what exists in the European and CELOC scientific and technological platforms to cooperate. There are already steps down, developments, achievements, and there are clear signs how to get forward on this uh, road. So for the moment, this is what I Thank can you. express. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will ask Dr. Luis Barba to continue. Well, um, some ideas about the possible collaboration with all these uh, very well developed infrastructures in, in Europe. And uh, it is clear that they have uh, been working for years, 20 years in some cases, and uh, even when we have been working during these 20 years, it is more recent, uh, the development of the network of the national laboratories. So there is a great opportunity to uh, improve, to speed up our development, uh, taking advantage of the experiences they have uh, been trying all these recent years. <clears throat> we have been, uh, we have testified how uh, they have changed from one small uh, uh, group of people and countries and then developed to the next step after some years another one and finally we are here <coughs> with the Perion as a formal and a great uh, organization. Well, in this, idea, in this uh, environment, in this frame, uh, I've been thinking that uh, there are two important things besides all the uh, previous uh, uh, ideas and expressions uh, that uh, we could focus to try to uh, not guarantee, but also to, to try to develop in, uh, in brief time and in better conditions this uh, cooperation. One is uh, uh, something that we have tried here in Mexico <coughs> to fulfill, and the idea is how to compare the results produced by different teams in different labs with different equipment uh, 
to be comparable at the end. So we should try to establish some uh, reference, some protocols, anything that at the end of the one project research or whatever, we, we got uh, comparable results from our analytical uh, equipment and uh, in this way try to avoid the, the spend of time without results. But to, to do something like that, we need in both sides to have uh, interest in some material. For example, <clears throat> to work on insects consumed in Mexico is going to be difficult that in Europe uh, are going to be interested I I in that. But uh, we have also chance to find something like, uh, for, him, for, for example, I have seen a lot of uh, pieces from Mesoamerica or America in general in uh, European museums. Those are in both sides, in both sides could be interesting uh, topics to focus on and uh, perhaps, this is just one idea, of how to find uh, these topics that are interested in, in, uh, in America and in Europe. Also, there is uh, something that changed in 16th century. It was the supply of food changed completely uh, with the uh, products of America that reach Europe and also the products of, from Europe that reach uh, America. It, it was a big change and it can be studied through the chemical residues in the ceramic pots. That could be an interesting topic that could be uh, focused by our researchers or uh, the people uh, that are part of our networks and <clears throat> perhaps could be one of the ideas that would, we could pursue. Well, that is uh, two uh, ideas that I want to express to you to uh, attend and perhaps uh, avoiding in this way to miss the opportunity of working together. Thank you. Please, Tom. Um, thank you, and I, um, uh, as, as you see from my slide here, my name tag, I come from the Getty Conservation Institute in Los Angeles, and even though the GCI is um, a full member of Iperion CH, and hence actually why I'm here, um, when whoever showed the slide of, of the um, geography of the IPM project and all the Europeans come together and Los Angeles couldn't be further away from, from this group and, of course, so close to Mexico. Um, it, it seems a, a slightly strange uh, panel to be on, and I, I think what I will not do um, is say any more about a potential European-Mexican uh, bilateral cooperation. That seems to make complete sense to me. There's clearly a lot of history, established agreements, some great ideas, a lot of activity. Um, so I have nothing more to add to that. Um, but maybe I could just say a few things just in general about um, some experiences we've had at the GCI uh, with um, collaborations in, in general. I mean, I, I hesitate to use this word best practice because um, that always seems to be stating that we're doing it the best way. Um, but I think good practice is a, is a nice way to think of this. Um, we um, do all kinds of collaborations. Uh, historically, we've done many uh, in Mexico. Um, not that many right now, uh, but I think that should be uh, corrected very, very quickly. Um, interesting enough, where Louise and the group was last week in Belo Horizonte in Brazil, um, 
for the last three or four years, we've been involved in a very close collaboration between the group um, of Luis Sousa and Fernando Marte uh, in Argentina, looking at um, a group of paintings from Brazil and Argentina uh, mid-century, 1950s, 1960s, abstract paintings, um, which have become very, very collectible uh, right now, a lot of, lot of interest about them, and they needed a lot of technical analysis uh, in Brazil in particular. Um, a lot of the house paints and industrial paints were, were being used for the first time. So it was a really effective collaboration based on the, the strength and the, the depth of the collections in the two countries and some of the analytical techniques that we had developed specifically for modern paints and how those were then um, uh, spread around the, 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 uh, the groups. Um, of course, funding always comes into these um, sit, sit situations. The Getty often is an extraordinarily privileged position that we don't always have to worry about funding. I mean, we cannot buy a synchrotron, um, but we have the, the dollars needed to participate uh, in travel and conferences and, and partnerships like, like that. Uh, very, very, very unusual. In this case, um, it was also a, a grant from the Getty Foundation that went to both of the groups to allow a really, really sort of equal um, level uh, uh, collaboration. Um, and we we're still doing this. We're still on ongoing. But it it just it was um, what was nice about it was that it was actually quite a small group. Um, I think sometimes collaborations and you know that there. are all different sorts of collaborations, and sometimes the big national government level or continent level collaborations are important. But also, I think probably because the GCI does not, thankfully, deal with our government so much directly, it's much more that individual small groups uh, where they can be just as effective. And I, I think some of the things um, Emilio was saying hold very, very true. Getting to know each other, often these things are successful with individuals driving them um, and um, yeah I mean there are all kinds of things that, that can be explored in, in, in sort of general in terms of um, what has worked in collaborations but I think I'll stop there now okay thank you Tom just listening all the comments one thing that's coming immediately is Yeti maybe a door to enter to Hyperion collaboration maybe easier perhaps because it's closer to to Mexico, uh, we may be also under the umbrella of Hyperion, and perhaps to uh, start to do something with less money and profit of these budgets that we have in order to perhaps um, try to, to make some kind of pilot project to see how it works and learn how to manage this collaboration with the Hyperion. It could be Perhaps uh, an idea that uh, for Mexico could, could be easier to handle. And pro and because as uh, Professor Kuhn say, we already have s some mm, facilities, some people that have some training, and perhaps we can try to profit of this experience. This is one idea that perhaps you want to, or you may discuss if it's possible to do it. So if resources is the problem, we need to try to make with less that we are perhaps very, very, uh, let's say, used to do that in Mexico. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think that the idea to have workshops is uh, very interesting to change people. Uh, I think that for Mexico, we have some particular, uh, let's say, um, topics that are interested for us is databases, uh, training, high-level training. Uh, on and uh, this, this uh, topic that has been mentioned by Luis Barba, the Mexican collections in Europe. But there are Mexican collections also in, in the United States and in other countries. It could be also a common point also to try to, to network in a more in a more efficient way. And I, I don't know, do you want to make another comment about all this? Well, l let me just respond very quickly to just, just the, the Getty's role in this. I mean, I, I, I mean, again, we are in this extraordinarily previous position, um, and we are open to all kinds of collaboration and partnerships. Um, I, we would welcome, you know, closer links with Mexico, 
Um, we, we are doing a lot more now with, with those two groups in, in South America, in particular Brazil and Argentina, and, and it's not seen as being once that project finishes, the collaboration stops. Um, it, th there is no formal agreement. There's no one signing collaborative agreements. We, we, we just build up this, this, this network, and it's very, very um, doable, and we've done this to have you know, researchers come to our labs to learn certain techniques or do things. We've done workshops down in both places. Um, so there's nothing, to, and it makes complete sense, let's face it, for us and this country, this city, this country, this university, to be doing much more together. I mean, there is a lot of just talking to Sandra at Coffee Break. There's just so much going on where there's an obvious overlap. So that, that I think, can happen, and I think we just have to we have to be a little bit careful about how we describe this as being, you know, a door to Iperion. Ab absolutely, but it's also, I have to be careful of the GCI that, you know, what, what we're, we're getting a lot of the benefits out of being part of the network in Iperion um, CH, and that was why I decided we should be part of this. It was actually my first decision I took, I think, um, when I became head of the science department, and Alberto de Tagle, who many of you will know, an ex-head of science and knew Luca very well, he got us together. Uh, he felt very strongly that he, he was sad that the GCI had been sort of pushed out of some of these European network projects and felt the time was right to come back in and knew that I would believe that. Um, and just to look at the list of, you know, partners in IPR and this extraordinary group of um, uh, labs, so it was an obvious decision for me. And we don't have to worry about how much money we, we receive to, to, you know, hire in certain people. So it, it made complete sense, but it does mean that all the money for the work we do on this project is coming from the Getty. So we just, just have to manage that a little bit, but in theory, the collaboration would love to do that. Okay. Yeah, Luca, you probably want to say something. Let me be pragmatic. I think it's my kind of work, or maybe I, I'm too old for not being pragmatic. Well, <coughs> last time when I came to Los Angeles inviting you, I came with kind of a menu. Look, this is the project. Do you like it? This time we can do better, I think. As we are discussing participation in Hyperion HS of Getty, of Lanchik, UNAM, we discussed it in Brazil, participation of Antecipa. Just to be Japanese way, just in time, tomorrow morning, the responsible of joint research activities in the next project has been appointed. He's the science director of the infrastructure, Loic Bertram. Loic is collecting proposals for joint research activities in Hyperion HS. This joint research needs to be cooperative. I said they need to be of interest at least to half, maybe more than half, the number of participants. And the number of participants in Hyperion HS is, on the side of Europe, 17 national nodes, plus, probably, GCI, Brazil, and Mexico. So it makes just a partnership of 20, but national nodes. National nodes will have the possibility of putting their science facilities in these joint research activities. The money, even on the European side, is not too much. But we can pilot the topic in order that this topic could be really of common interest, not just for Europe, because this is the moment. We are starting collecting proposals in these days. So that's my offer. I will keep you in the loop with all the national coordinators in Europe involved in sketching the work program of Hyperion HS. And in next week, because we need to work, we have un from here until to, let's mm. say, early February to define this agenda of joint research activities. You can have your say. This is not of my interest, so it's not having with the menu, but we are opening a restaurant, so <laughs> let's, plot, let's pl plot the menu together. <laughs> and this other idea, thank you, Luca. And this other idea of the round robins and the way to have these protocols, common protocols, could be also something that we can do with, uh, let's say, a uh, few, few money, because we just need to send the, s the materials or reference, the reference, reference materials or, or the, th the materials, and we can exchange data and we can learn about these protocols. Reference material is already of interest in Europe, so I think it would be one of the proposals. Digital research could be one other common ground for this new project, so 
there are things that could help having actu an actual cooperation or just a, a dreaming of cooperation. Okay, I see. And one thing that was has been discussed in the Brazilian meeting was this legal figure that has antici anticipated. In our case, it's, as you saw, it's an academic network of laboratories and, and people is willing to participate and to do many things within this network. That is something that is really interesting. I was surprised when you said that in Italy it could be impossible to have a network of universities working together. Okay. At least in Italy, but I think in most of Europe, the situation could be this one. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we were also discussing in Mexico to have some kind of a, as an, an, uh, some kind of anticipa <coughs> group, which is a social, uh, how you say, C uh, civil association, a consortium, a consortium yeah. uh, but it's not like a consortium because consortium has some at least some, let's say, financial. Uh, Issues, yes, but a private uh, yes, a private association uh, with all the people that mainly is in the network. This could be also useful to improve the collaborations or not. Yeah, yes, it could. I was there in Brazil when they signed Anticip Anticipa three years ago. I was at the signature in Belo Horizonte. It was thought as very nice m modality to overcome the problems of having in a federal state different countries in the federal states and different institutions. So the agreement was born from coordinators of facilities in a certain sense. It has been a very nice solution. It took two years in Brazil, as you heard, to come to the full formalization of the of the group, then that the, the last week they had the first uh, plenary meeting of Antecipa after three years from the signature. So it's going to take some time. And another point that I discussed there in Brazil is, okay, Antecipa has got a formal status, but got no resources. So that could be a problem in participating in European projects. If you don't have resources, you could not claim that you are performing activities unless you have a policy of secondment clear in that you can demonstrate to the European Commission that the science activities will be made by seconded personnel to the consortium. Actually, you are not paid, so you can declare whatever you want, but um, a, a bit of formality is needed to the participation to European projects. So also in Brazil, I suggested to Luis, in case Anticipa is not fitting for the model of uh, European project uh, bureaucracy, you could use one of its uh, institutions, either the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Um, that could be an easy, an easy solution. It's already adopted in several parts of Europe, like in Denmark, for participating to the project. So yes, it could be also useful uh, here, but it could be use useful if it plans to develop into a real uh, federal research infrastructure, that's what I said in Brazil. You have all the chances of having Antecipa as the subject for the federal research infrastructure in Brazil. You just need to have it funded. That could be a similar process also here because it's easier, bottom-up approach, it's easier and it can give results in <coughs> shorter times. Yes. Is one working. Is one is working. Oh, Marta is uh, is the direction for integration in the Iris in the Iris group. So yeah. <laughs> so this roundtable is exploring uh, best practices practices in research infrastructures. No. So you have been mentioning many aspects which are of interest. Most importantly, uh, funding, uh, knowing each other, uh, different bilateral collaborations. Uh, identifying topics no, that are of common interest, both at two sides of the Atlantic or within the continent. I would like to stress another, another aspect that is very important in research infrastructures. Well, it, it has been marginally mentioned, that is training. 
and training is done uh, in in different uh, in different ways. Uh, one obvious um, aspect is access, no? Because uh, research infrastructures offer access to users to carry on different research projects. And we in Aperion and other <coughs> infrastructures that I know at, at the European level, uh, these um, users are uh, teams in, in where PhD students are uh, incorporated. And in many cases, their access um, project resulted as an important part of their PhD project. So this is something that we have to bear in mind that uh, going to use access in research infrastructures is, is used for training of new researchers. But there is another aspect that goes uh, with training, and that is the training of the people who run the providers of this access. And for that, there is a lot of exchange that can be, uh, um, can be going on in between different uh, facilities, because uh, this uh, makes facilities interoperable, uh, improves protocols. Um, so this, this other aspect is very important in research infrastructures, and we have that in Iperion and in other initiatives, and we surely will have that in, in the next uh, um, integrating activity, Iperion HS. So this also for, for you, for this continent, uh, could be a, a subject of interest because within Iperion HS, we will organize workshops training activities, so you can profit of this uh, very important aspect of research infrastructure. <coughs> they are very good uh, grounds uh, for training in these two aspects that I mentioned. Thank you. We were discussing, you were not in Brazil, Mart, unfortunately, but we were discussing, uh, unfortunately, we, we were discussing about organizing a training camp in Brazil. And Tsipa was discussing about organizing a training camp. Uh, I would like to add that one thing that's important is what that, for instance, in Mexico we have more or less the same kind of equipment now, nowadays. Yeah. So it could be also to bring the ex experts, could be also a, a very easy way because we had money to do that. It's easier than had money to send students, but this could be also an activity that we can propose. And you know, we have many equipment. It could be easier to have more students that can receive all this training. And also like the colleagues that are working with those equipments. Uh, someone would like to add something to the discussion of the, from the round table or from the public? Any comment? Sandra is part of the LANSIC in the Art History Institute. Uh, yes, thank you. Just to add another idea of a topic that could be of interest probably to all of us no, in Europe, in America, and North South America, North America is modern paints. I, I mean, it, I'm not bringing water to my meal, but <laughs> it's like, no, it's, it's probably something that we share. Artists going, working in Europe, a lot of 20th century artists were trained in Europe and came back to Mexico and well Mexico also uh, worked in the United States the Mexican artists and South America so I think that would be an, an, interest, uh, an interesting subject probably thank you so can I can I just respond that Sandra? So this is maybe a conversation you, you and I have with others in the university. But how so? How would you see that? And I, I agree entirely. And I think obviously the subject has had a lot of research background, art historical research, scientific analysis, looking at conservation of these. All, so there's a, there's a lot of activity. So what what would it need to do in your opinion to make this much stronger? Um, a collaboration within Mexico and the US or the Europe or whoever is is, is it is it, a, is it a big thing or can it just happen fairly quickly? Uh, 
Uh, I think that, well, uh, there are many problems, no? Organic pigments uh, fading. We have also degradation problems on, on zinc uh, uh, oxides, no? We have like uh, several like very specific subjects and also like developing like protocols to uh, really make diagnose more efficient in, uh, no? in, with imaging techniques. I mean, all of this is like in, in the way, in their way, <laughs> but it's not really happening, no? It's like, a, I think we probably could uh, like choose some subjects, like precise subjects, and, and as you said, like sh uh, at least said, no? Like sharing some protocols for, for doing the, no? Yeah. The, the, the technical analysis probably of, of similar uh, problems in different countries, or, or maybe, uh, yes, or picking an artist, I don't know, no? It's, it's yeah, no, uh, quite, I, I think that was the answer to my question, which, which actually feels like there's so much work going on already here, and you have equipment, you have facilities, you have art collections, you have uh, all these other things, so you, it wouldn't be like you'd have to submit a big application for a funding agency to be able to do this work uh, at, at, a, at a certain level, you could start straight away. We, do, we just, just need, right, we just need to figure out some key concepts, some areas of research. Yeah, okay. Well, th this is, you know, you're 90% of the way there if, if, if sort of existing infrastructure and internal funding and resources of, you know, equipment and students and staff is in place already, then it's a really actually easy thing to, to, to move on, yeah. Yes, and also just to add to Jose Luis's uh, address of, of the students, also the univers our university has programs for, for students to, to travel, no? So also, no? Like specific. Mm. Uh, yes, and I have to say that also by, we had an experience with Costa Rica that was very interesting because there is now the UNAM has uh, offices around the world in different countries, even in Europe the state we have three. In Costa Rica, the office helped to, to have this meeting with the people of the university and to build this group of research on cultural heritage. And they have the equipment uh, now because Costa Rica has some, some budget by comparison to other countries in Central America. And for us, it was very interesting because we are providing all this uh, training for the people. And I think it's a similar experience in the other way that we are have to, to, to let's say, find a way to, to make it e in better, in a better way. Uh, okay, uh, I am Michal Opalinski from the Czech Republic, from the Academy of Sciences. And in the year 2003, I was here at UNAM for 10 months at the SECADET, uh, the uh, Centro de Ciencias Aplicadas y Desarrollo Tecnológico. And I just wanted to address a little bit uh, this, um, um, this uh, discussion about the students. Uh, recently, in September, uh, we did um, an exchange of one uh, doctorate student here from Mexico, from the, from the Madrid Laboratory. Adriana Hernandez, which will be present, I think, tomorrow even here. And uh, it was uh, quite easy. I mean, UNAM is very good, uh, as said my colleague here, is very good in supporting these programs. I think it's even uh, easier for the Mexican students to go for some time to Europe than uh, vice versa, I would say. So she was quite easily able to get uh, the resources, I think from CONACYT, the cooperation with UNAM to go to the Czech Republic and be there in our laboratory in the Academy of Sciences and making some uh, common research, let's say, uh, on some 3D printed things on our, on our uh, devices. And it was quite successful. So definitely this thing is possible without a big uh, problem, so I would say. Okay, yes, I, ag I agree. Uh, I was thinking also in another part that's important, that is the relationship with the national institution that are taking care of the cultural heritage. That's something that we have to work hardly, and also to try to give them the ways also to access to this training that, uh, that I think is very important. Uh, we are trying always to share as much, as much as possible and give the access to the institutions, but also we need to also to work in these ways to improve the, the collaboration and the access to, to resources and laboratories. So 
There's a question there. Yes, I'm Isabel Medina from the National Institute of, of Anthropology. And I would also like to add the importance of publications and new ways of sharing knowledge and also uh, opportunities to share experience on training because I think that training, of course, is, is key in heritage science. But I don't think that we talk very much about how to train people in this, in this area. And, uh, and also, I think that we have to address the, um, the issue that not all the people in Mexico will have access to, to move to globally. Therefore, we need to also think about uh, new platforms, online platforms for, for training. I don't know whether there are some experience. So it's, 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 it's about information, ways of training, and also, of course, opportunities that are abroad and also in place. Yes, I think it was, will be presented in the presentation about training, but the strategy of training of IRIS is including these kind of modules, because we know the, the point. With training, uh, the, the, the problem we face, and we know that we face that problem, is how to train for transdisciplinarity, which is the ex exact mix of competencies that the new heritage scientists will need to have. And we know, I believe that we, we will never exclude uh, experts, disciplinary experts, because they are important, they are fundamental for some solutions. But in heritage science, we need someone to speak with disciplinary expert, some people which are capable of synthesis between the best of the disciplines involved. But without this synthesis, I think that will be presented in, in, in later presentation. Without that kind of synthesis, there's no advancement in knowledge because the specialist sees only one part of the problem, one aspect. Being the specialist in, in art history or specialist in chemist uh, is the same. He sees only one part of the problem. So modern science implies cross-disciplinarity towards transdisciplinarity because modern science has got to do with more and more complex problems. And finally, we know we are working in heritage science since maybe 20, 30, 40 years. We know that heritage science is one of the most difficult applied sciences because the materials we find are totally unique and different from case to case. We cannot rely on models. We don't have theories. We don't have theories describing models. So it's a very, very difficult science, which in years and years has come with very, very low support. Who knows what? I don't know particularly why this field of science has been so neglected by from public funding throughout the whole world, because there's a situation everywhere in the planet. So for the first time, we are realizing that our science is difficult. It's not uh, a pastime for specialists. Uh, they don't want anymore to be specialists. As <laughs> it's not uh, a charity f towards the heritage. It's a new science in the modern uh, realm of disciplines. And as such, it, ne it needs to be planned. It needs to be organized. And it needs to be treated. That is the message of Iris. To the political message of Iris. Well, uh, it's my comment is on, on Michal's uh, one. No, Michal, no, I think it was yours. Sorry. It is about the uh, involvement of uh, the heritage owners, the heritage institutions. I think this is very, this is a, a very critical point in, in this field. In Iperion, we have, as partners of Iperion, we not only have uh, research institutions or uh, and uh, universities, we also have museums, we have the National Gallery, the National Museum of Denmark, we have as partners uh, conservation institutions such as the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute or the, or the Belgium, the Kikirpa. Um, and uh, <coughs> in our network in Spain, in Techno Heritage, we have also made a big effort to incorporate uh, these, these institutions. I think it's critical because, um, first of all, uh, the 
academic institutions uh, can uh, provide some services to these uh, institutions, these cultural institutions. They have the heritage, so they have, let's say, the questions. They are the people who have the questions. But moreover, they have also some resources that uh, can be interested uh, from the other side, from the academic institutions. And in that way, uh, Art, Art Lab, for instance, uh, I think is a very uh, interesting idea, a very interesting platform. Uh, I think Rafaela will later explain more on that. But we know there, there are, uh, there is a huge amount of uh, scientific information that has been obtained and is stored and is managed by these institutions, by the museums or by the uh, cultural institutions. This information is uh, usually it's not easy to access. It is not open. Uh, typically, it is not open to to everybody. They don't have, of course, the the, the purpose is different. So it is not. Uh, Publishing their results is not, uh, in many cases, uh, 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 a very strong part of the activities as it is in the uh, research uh, institutions. So um, their involvement in the art lab, I think it is, it is a, a good example of how this information can be further used and can contribute to developing knowledge, uh, knowledge in this in this field. So this collaboration with these uh, cultural institutions, heritage owners, heritage managers, or conservation institutions uh, can benefit uh, both sides. It can also help to change uh, some kind of um, opposition culture that is, I, I think, it's, that probably happens everywhere. Uh, the collaboration between the museums or the cultural institutions and the academic and research institutions in this field is always difficult. Uh, we know that we come from different uh, fields. We have different aims. Our institutions have different aims, have different needs. And uh, being together in these projects, in these networks, helps to develop um, a culture of confidence or trust, a, a culture of trust uh, to each other and to understand each other. Again, it's, it's a question of knowing each other and to know better what can we offer and what can we learn uh, from the others. So I think it is also a very, a very important point in developing these uh, this kind of projects or infrastructures. So I would like to comment something else from the table. Do you want to comment something, Luis? Okay. Okay. I I, I agree with you. Uh, in the network, we have some labs that are in the uh, museums. Very few, because we have very few labs in the museums. But there are also some labs that are in the National Coordination of, Co of Conservation that will be also part of the program of tomorrow. And we have some labs from the schools of uh, conservation. And there are some labs in the School of Archaeology, but we don't have any group so far. Uh, but we may in the future. So, And you're right. It's It would be interesting to see how are you managing this. And let's say that Mexico, as other countries, have special, let's say, a legal frame for the cultural heritage. And this is something that we okay we have to manage how to to make this work in a better way, considering all these aspects that uh, are in in the laws. So it's, I'm sure it's different that in Brazil and in other countries where, or in the state, that uh, is very dif different the the legal frame concerning the cultural heritage, the collection, the access to the collections and to the samples or other things. In Spain, we have 18 frameworks for that. One national and one for each of the regional uh, governments, uh, because cultural heritage is the direct responsibility of the regional governments. So the landscape is complicated, <laughs> indeed. 
Um, I, I would just respond to something that would build build on something that Luca mentioned about this problem with uh, interdisciplinarity. And um, I, I mean, my my impression, just based at the GCI, we you know we have a department of about 25 people, and there's been quite a sort of big turnover in the last few years. So I've been hiring in a lot of people, and um, my feeling is that the vast majority of the scientists coming in get into disparity very strongly already. So I, I, I suspect there are people, of course, who still struggle with that. If you're immersed in a university setting, perhaps, and don't get exposed to the other parts of this question, perhaps. But I, I, uh, Luke, if you were saying this is a problem, I, I would slightly disagree with you. I, I, I actually think there are a lot of people, and actually most of the people we've been hiring recently have come from Europe. Uh, it, it's not a, a strategy. Um, you know, we do op op open calls, but there's a very strong group of people coming out of all kinds of countries uh, in Europe, and uh, it's one of the things we, we look for. Um, but I, I'm not detecting any real problem in, in that, as that aspect, in, in sort of globally. I mean, yes, of course, you're always going to get people who have a different background, who, who struggle to think out, out of the box or who can't you know, get, out, get out, out of the weeds. But I, I, at the moment, I'm not seeing that as a major problem for our field going forward. I mean that just the legal frame for the access to the cultural heritage is different. So just I just yeah. wanted to say that, that it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other comment from public or people in the room? People, no. I think uh, we can make uh, some. We can stress on the points that we need to take care. Okay, try to do something with a uh, few resources, workshops, um, exchange of uh, experts, training. It's some of the points that uh, we would like to develop. Drone robins and protocols uh, is something that we can also do with uh, not a lot of money. And this, that is something interesting for Mexicans, that is the access to the collections that are in Europe or in other countries uh, related with our cultural heritage. And <laughs> publications, I think something that has been mentioned. Now there are some experiences in Mexico with uh, electronic publications. I think it's something that we need to consider. And this uh, training using the online platforms. So uh, we know that uh, before it was easier to, to go to Europe often. But now we have less resources. This could be a way to, to work together and to do something uh, to develop the methods and and learn about the the possibilities uh, i think now the problem is not the instruments at least for mexico it's not a problem to have the instruments so uh, we are lucky to have uh, laboratories to carry out uh, the research so mm, we need to think also let's say let's uh, say that this research had been developed in mexico trying to fix all these legal frames, the uh, low budget, and so on. And I think the results are good. We have a good network. We have equipment. We are trying to reach places that has very few resources, but interesting problems in different kind of weathers, uh, tropical areas, and desertic places, uh, and so on. So. We have a lot of problems that uh, we need to solve. And to have the opportunity to exchange these experiences is something that we want to profit. And uh, we are very happy to, to listen to these ideas about how we can um, try to, to make a better collaboration with you. So if you there is no more comments, uh, comments, I will say that we can stop and go for lunch. I think some people will be very happy to do that, <laughs> <laughs> like me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will continue after the lunch. And there will be so some coffee here also at the entrance of, of the auditorium. And we will have the second part 
uh, in the afternoon from three o'clock. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for for uh, um, our colleagues from the from Europe, um, for also some of the people, there will be some some food here in the garden, like in the meeting that we had before. We have some limitation in the places, but if you can uh, join us, it's possible. Thank you. <laughs>